Praise God. Well, we've been in a series on being a disciple of Jesus, and I thought, well, we could go on, but um, they are, when I do series, by the way, the people always, uh, people who investigate, you know, I don't follow, how can I put this right? I don't follow the kind of advice that people give, well, if you want to have maximum people listening to you, you should do these things, you know. I don't tend to do that. So one thing you're never meant to do is to do series, because the idea is, well, people lose interest as a series goes on. Always do one-off special messages. Well, I've, I'm guilty of breaking that uh, that rule. But uh, all things have to come to an end, so I thought, well, we'll bring, we need to bring our series to an end on being a disciple of Jesus, although it's such an important theme. And we've been looking of course, of what, it, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus, because that's what we are. That's what we're called to be. And uh, we talked about how we enter into discipleship by believing the gospel, the gospel of God's love for us in Jesus Christ, and how he died for us, and how he saved us, and how he won our hearts, and how to be a disciple is all about us being formed by his spirit and by his word to be his true disciples, to become like Jesus. So in completing the series today, I want to zoom out actually because I haven't given the whole picture by any means because in a way we've left what's most important to last because we need to zoom out and see the bigger picture. Um, to see what it's all about, and really perhaps to cover the highest truth in the New Testament about our relationship with God. The th that th truth, really, that defines the whole thing, that defines our identity, that controls our destiny. Uh, the thing that was at the center of Jesus' own life and, and all his thoughts the relationship that, that he, he describes as determining his, his very being and all his actions. And that same relationship that he came to bring us into. And that is the fatherhood of God. God is our father. And we, it's, it's in some ways easier just to relate to Jesus because he became a man. And, you know, we, we can relate perhaps easily to Jesus and we can forget the fact that actually what it's all about is Jesus has come to connect us back to the Father and that we, being sons of the Father, is ultimately what it's all about. To, to kind of explain this and, and to, to get us to get a more balanced perspective on our salvation, let me just tell you a story of, of a lost boy maybe in his teens and he was fatherless he sinned he committed crimes he stole and he got caught and now he's standing before a judge and this judge is known for being absolutely righteous and fair and this judge he, he comes before the judge and of course, he's guilty. He can't even pretend to be innocent. And the judge does something extraordinary. He pronounces him guilty, but then he steps in and the fine, let's say, that this boy had to pay, the, ju the judge opens his wallet and he pays the fine in full. And he says, that's, that's what, you, what justice demands of you, but I pay it in full. And now I declare you acquitted. And of course, that's a, that's a wonderful picture of our salvation. And we glory in the fact that our sins are forgiven. That they're paid for. Hallelujah. And even further, that we are justified. Which basically means we are declared innocent. We are declared or even righteous in the sight of the law. In the sight of God, our judge. And that is, to be honest with you, what we tend to focus on the, at the most. And we, the, but the story does not end there. Because this same judge did not stop at that point. 
But he displayed his grace and his love in a, in a far greater way than that, that act of judicial forgiveness and redemption. He does something extraordinary. He sees that boy is lost. And he then adopts him. Can you imagine that happening? That he adopts him as his own son. And now that child, that boy, is not just forgiven. He is now adopted into a very noble family. And now that child is a son. And that child now stands to inherit everything from his father now. And that is a picture of what God has done for us. He, did, he is not just the judge and the one who has forgiven us our sins and made us right. And, and that is a glorious truth that was restored by Luther in the Reformation. But since then, even in the Protestant world, the truth has not really been, uh, the, the other side has not been sufficiently impressed upon us that salvation doesn't stop there that the the highest glory of salvation is that we are now adopted to be his sons his children hallelujah and therefore we are heirs with christ and joint joint heirs with christ and heirs of god or and all the inheritance is ours And so we don't just stop at forgiveness and justification. We need to rejoice in the greater glory that God makes us his sons. And we must never take that for granted. I I love 1 John 3, 1, which again expresses that this is in a sense the height of God's grace to us. 1 John 3, 1, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. That's the awesome thing. Not just that we're forgiven and justified, but we should be children of God. That's awesome. Therefore, the world doesn't know us because it didn't know him. Beloved, verse 2, now we are children of God, but we haven't come into the full potential of our sonship yet. There is a glorious future coming. And it says it it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. In in other words, it's even beyond our imagination what our sonship is going to mean when we come into the fullness, the full manifestation of the sons of God, as Romans 8 says. It It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. When who is revealed? The son of God. The son. It's talking about the father-son relationship. That's the context, really, for the whole New Testament. And that's the thing that makes the New Testament different and on a higher level than the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. Because it's saying that we come into the same relationship with God the Father as the Son of God. And it says, we shall be like him. Just as Jesus is now in the fullness of his sonship. He is our example. He's the model. And in Christ, we are also sons of God. And we will become like him. For we will see him as he is. Hallelujah. You see, the angels of God know God as the sovereign, as the creator, as the commander, the provider. But they do not know him as their personal father. They're on the outside of the Trinity, as it were, rather than on the inside of the family of God. They're servants, but they're not sons. Although they are created by God directly, but in the fullest sense of the word, they are not sons. Israel was called the son of God, but that was only as a nation. But not the individual Jews were not, you know, wouldn't describe themselves as sons of God, more as servants of God. And so... It was prophesied, however, that when the Messiah came, he would be the Son of God. And also, and and we'll see one of those prophecies, that through the new covenant that he brings, he will bring us into sonship. And that was the, the awesome thing. When Jesus came, the main unique thing that distinguished him from the prophets of old 
was his claim to be the Son of God. He was indeed the unique Son of God. He is the only b- eternally begotten Son of God. So in that sense, he's unique in his sonship. But, uh, and the, the way that Jesus described his identity constantly, and especially in John's Gospel, is that he is, and he constantly talked in these terms, that he, his identity, he was the son of his father. And his whole life centered on his relationship to the father. And in this, he was different from the prophets that had come before, that mostly I would identify themselves as servants of God. And as we've seen in this series, we are still the servants of God. We don't lose that, but we are more than his servants. We are also his sons. Hallelujah. And it's the highest, it's the highest honor. It's the highest privilege to be a son of God. And when Jesus declared that he was the son of God, the Jewish leaders understood this claim as blasphemy. This was so outrageous that a man could call himself the son of God. And so they tried to kill him for it. The amazing thing is that he didn't just come as the son of God, but he came to make it possible for us to become sons of God also in his image. To come into the same relationship that he had eternally with God as the son of God. And that is amazing. In other words, he came to expand God's family. God's eternal family, if you like, is, you know, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And now he wants to have children that come into the fellowship of the Trinity as sons and daughters. Hallelujah. And through the sonship of Jesus, Jesus revealed what it was like to be God's son. And how a son of God lives. And how a son of God glorifies his father and obeys his father and seeks to please his father and honors his father and how the father honors his son and trusts his son to represent him in the earth. And so he showed us what it is to be God's son. And he came to bring us into sonship ourselves through union with him. Through our union with Christ, we, who is the Son, we become sons of God. Hallelujah. And so Jesus, in this way of thinking, he is, as well as being our Lord, he is also our elder brother. He is the firstborn among many brethren. He's our elder brother. He's our greater brother. And he's the, we fought. So discipleship, you see, in a sense then, is following our elder brother, as he shows us what it means because he's to be a son of the father so discipleship in in a sense is 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 coming to into the the truth of god being our father and us being his sons and living that out in our life living as sons of god you are in a great royal family you are children of a king of the king hallelujah you are royal Hallelujah. I can always remember our postcode, OX27RF. You can always say 7RF, Royal Family. <laughs> That's my address. Matthew 11:27. Jesus described this wonderful verse here. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. My Father, I love that. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. So here Jesus claims to be uniquely the Son of God. He has knowledge, inner knowledge, that only those within the family know about. Those outside the family, like the angels, they may know many things, but they are not in the family, in that sense. Only Jesus, at that point, could say he has that unique knowledge of the Father. He has that special relationship of Father, Son. Hallelujah. And he says there's no one else, and no human being, no angel, just him at that point. And notice, though, what he says next, which is talking about us. 
No one knows the Father except the Son, and those, or the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So Jesus is predicting here that he chooses to reveal himself to certain ones, his chosen ones, the believers. And that will be a revelation of the Father. In other words, he is, doesn't want to stay the only son. He wants to bring others into himself, into sonship with him, into the same relationship to the Father that he has. And that is the remarkable and the special thing about the, what the new covenant does. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11, sorry, Hebrews chapter 1 talks on these lines. Verse 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past, that's the Old Testament, to the fathers by the prophets, has in these date last days spoken to us by his son or literally in his son. And what he's saying is, Yes, God spoke through the prophets, the message of God, and we learned much about God through the Old Testament. But there's a new level of revelation coming now because now he's spoken to us in his son. Now God is revealing a whole new relationship with God, which is sonship. And now he comes as the son to bring us into sonship whom he has appointed heir of all things. And we see consistently in the Bible, inheritance comes with sonship. It's sons who inherit the estate, the glory of God. And Jesus brought us into this new relationship with God through his death and resurrection. And he brought in the new covenant. And through union with him, we become sons of God. That is awesome that we would be sons of God. And he goes on in verse 3, describing Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. So he is God in the fullest sense. When he, then he became a man also. And he by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He the, the risen Jesus represents us at the right hand of God and he's forgiven our sins. But notice what he says, having, verse 4, having become so much better than angels. Now, as God, he was always better than angels. But it's talking about his humanity now. In his humanity, he identified with us, he took our sins and then he was resurrected from the dead and he was ascended to heaven and he sits at the right hand of God as a resurrected man. Yes, the God man, but he is the resurrected man. And he, why did he do this? So that he could bring us to glory with him. You see, as God, he was always the son of God, but he also became, as a man, the son of God and resurrected as a son of God. And because he is also a man, it means we can be united to him through faith uh, and we can be exalted with him into sonship. You see, that's what Jesus did for us. So it's in his humanity, verse 4, he became so much better than the angels. Positionally, we are higher than the angels because we are sons of God. As he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. This is in his humanity. For Verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son? You see, this is a privilege that is given to us. Today I have begotten you. And it's talking about his resurrection from the dead. And uh, today I have begotten you. So as a man, he comes into that full New covenant sonship. And why did he do it? He did it. He already had sonship as God. But as a man, he came into it. Into the fullness of it through his resurrection. So that we could come into that same relationship with God. And, and it says, and again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to, to me a son. And the, and the key is, this is something that 
eternally he's the son of God, but he also brought it to pass in human, through his humanity so that we could come into that same relationship. Notice in chapter 2, it picks up on this in verse 10. Hebrews 2.10, for it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. That is God's plan for you, to make you his son and to bring you to glory. Sonship is the key to your destiny. He is bringing you to glory. He is changing you from glory to glory right now. And he is bringing you into the glory of the sons of God. Hallelujah. And he says, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are of one. And this is really of one womb, one origin. We are sons born again from the same womb as Jesus in his manhood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so he, we are all brothers and sisters, and Jesus is our elder brother. And we are all formed from the same womb of the death and resurrection of Christ. For which reason, this is awesome too, verse 11 to 12, he is, for this reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother, sister. You are family. Hallelujah. Not just servants, you are family. Beloved, verse 12, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. And, when, and, and in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. So in other words, from one point of view, it's amazing that as we assemble together and as we praise God, Jesus is in the midst and he is praising the Father. As our elder brother, he's praising the Father along with all of us together. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. I'll declare my name. I'm, uh, he's not ashamed to call us brothers. Hallelujah. And sisters. And that's why Christ's first words after his resurrection, the very first words he spoke to Mary Madeline, John 20, verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren. See, this was kind of new... Generally, new language. You are now my brethren. And he say to them, I am ascending to my father. Well, they were used to Jesus calling God his father. But notice now what he adds. Because now he's raised, he's died, and he's risen from the dead. He's established a new covenant. Now we come into a new relationship. Before it was prophesied, but now it became reality. I, he is not just my father, but he's also your father. Hallelujah. I am ascending to my father and your father because I've cut this new covenant. Now you can come into me through faith in me. You come into the son and now you are sons of God too. Hallelujah. My father and your father to my God and to your God. Hallelujah. And, and the prayer Jesus prayed, just his high priestly prayer in John 17 uh, is all about this. Jesus, verse 1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, uh, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. And, and see, we see from Jesus, especially in the Gospels, and John in particular, we see this Father-Son relationship, and that is the model for our relationship with God. And notice what's on his heart is that the Son would glorify the Father and the Father would glorify the Son. And they love one another. The Son loves his, the Father. Everything the Son does is, is out of love for his Father. That's why he was obedient in every way. Out of love for the Father. Primarily, that was his primary motive. He loved us too, don't get me wrong, but his primary motive is he wanted to love his father, he wanted to honor his father, he wanted to glorify his father. His heartbeat was that the father would be glorified, and in the same way we see that the, the father glorifies the son and honors the son. And that should be our motivation. That's why we want to walk, be a disciple, a, a, obedient to God in our life. 
is that we want to please our Father. We want to glorify our Father. We want to make him famous in the earth. We want people to look on us and be drawn to the Father. You see, that's our motivation. And, th and that's why we want to confess our sins when we mess up. Because some people have a trouble with that because they're thinking in terms of the courtroom. They're thinking, well, I thought I was justified. I thought I was forgiven. Why should I have to confess my sins? But they're thinking in the wrong category. They're thinking in terms of the courtroom. Yes, we have been forgiven and justified, but they, we need to think in terms of sonship now. We're in a family. We're in a royal family which has very high standards. And we want to be those who please our Father. And when we sin and, and our heart convicts us, it is only right, it's only appropriate that we acknowledge our sin before our father and say father i'm sorry i've i've not acted in a way that is appropriate for us for a son of god for such a high calling that i have and so forgiveness and so on is is a family thing family forgiveness uh, uh, once we are sons of god uh, notice uh, verse 6, John 17, verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. And what name did Jesus manifest that was new? It was God being the Father. He's addressed this prayer to the Father. And so the name or the relationship that Jesus came to reveal and bring us into was the fatherhood of God. He says, I've manifested what that is, that you are the, our Father. He manifested what it means to be a son of God. Verse 25, John 17. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. Verse 26. And I have declared to them your name. He has declared the fatherhood of God. And I, w and I will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. And now that's something awesome there. He's talking about uh, our union with Christ, that we will be one with Christ. And because we are one with Christ, we come into the same relationship to the Father as Jesus Christ himself. And the same love that the Father has for Jesus, the Son, he has for us as sons of God. That's hard for us to even receive. But God the Father loves us just as much as he loves his son, Jesus Christ. We are in the same relationship of love. Hallelujah. So Jesus came to bring us into the same relationship with the Father as himself. And this is really what discipleship is about. It starts by us being born again. to Becoming sons of God. Born again into his family. And then we are to grow up from little babies to little children. To children. And ultimately to mature sonship. Where we are just like our father. Where we can represent our father in the earth. Where we can glorify him just like Jesus did. That's our aim. To be just like our elder brother who perfectly was the image of the Father and showed and glorified and pleased the Father in everything he did. That is the one we look up to. You know, like younger children will look up to older children, hopefully the older children setting the good example, um, and they want to be like their older brother. And in the same way, Jesus is our older brother. He shows us what it's like to live and be a son of God, and the kind of authority a son of God can walk in, in the earth. Praise God. So in the bigger picture, discipleship is following Jesus, our elder brother, as he leads us into full maturity and inheritance as sons of our Father God. Now this explains, uh, adds extra light to Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, which is the classic discipleship verse, you might say. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. 
And I just want to point out, of course, this is a tremendous, verse 19 is a Trinitarian verse. The name, that is one name, one God, but he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that God describes himself, he has to describe himself in human language so we can understand, but the human language he chooses to describe himself is Father and Son. So that is the ultimate. So in other words, there's nothing higher than sonship. All right? The Bible uses many different words to describe who we are and our relationship with God, but the, the supreme one, the one that in a sense takes, takes it all, gathers everything together into one, is father-son relationship, the fatherhood of God. Because that is the very relationship within the Trinity. And so by bringing us into sonship, God is really saying, I'm bringing you into my intimate family. I'm bringing you into the fellowship of the Trinity. That is something that angels can only stand in amazement at. What these funny lumps of clay are destined for glory as sons of God. And so when we were saved, actually, the Bible says we were baptized into Christ. and uh, We became one with Christ. And, and so we were baptized into the Son. And water baptism, actually, and he says should be done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But water baptism is really a picture, a proclamation of what God did at the moment of salvation. You were baptized into Christ. And but instead of normally it's described as baptism into Christ, but here it's described as baptism into union with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that is telling us that we baptism water baptism is a picture, and that's why it has to be by immersion, because baptism means immersion. God took us and immersed us into God Himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are, and positionally, we are positioned and put into the Son. Okay? And by being put into the Son, we are put into the same relationship with the Father as the Son. And the same relationship to the Holy Spirit as the Son. So in every way in which Jesus lived his life here, is a picture of how we are to relate to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And this is telling us that now, in Christ, he loves us just like the Father loves the Son. And, and really, being a disciple is just living out that reality of our sonship. It's the highest, the greatest gift, and the greatest privilege. It's the foundation for our identity. And the nature of our future glory as sons of God. It's the basis for our inheritance. So I just want to draw your attention to some of the classic passages. Uh, I'll just make brief comments, but these are the classic passages on sonship. Just for your own meditation, these are the first places I would recommend you go. Let's go first to John 1.12. It says, as many as received him. To them he gave the right to become children of God. And this is talking about our adoption. First of all, it was something that was done legally. We were given the right to become children of God. Uh, and uh, we were adopted as sons. And I don't know if some here, I know one or two of you who are adopted. And the, true, the good thing of adoption is... You were chosen. You were chosen. And in the same way, God chose us to be his sons. And he gave us the right. When we believe on him, we are given the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. But notice verse 13 says, it's not just a legal thing. It's a, we are also regenerated. And, and Hebrew says, well, he is the father of our spirits. And so it, it's not limited to adoption, because we are actually literally born from 
God. God's spiritual DNA is in us. Hallelujah. Through the new birth. Because verse 13 says that we were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh or the will of man, but of God. So notice, first of all, we are born of God. God is our Father. The spirit with that of the new birth within us. We are a new creation. We are born of God. We carry that potentiality and that potentiality for glory. That's why it talks about the manifestation of the sons of God. That which is born in us. And when you see a little baby, it may not seem like up to much. But when that baby comes into its full growth and its full potential, he or she could be this awesome person. And in the same way, I suppose, spiritually speaking, we're still far away from achieving our full potential as sons of God. But the day is coming when we will come into the full manifestation of who we are as sons of God. And uh, notice he says we are born of God. Just what is he saying in these other phrases? Not of blood. That is saying that you don't have that special relationship with God because of your bloodline. Because you're Jewish, for example. Or because you're English. Or because you're Indian. That doesn't do it for you. No nationality has any advantage as far as that's concerned. You are not born a Christian. You are not born into the family of God. It's not of blood. Neither is it of the will of the flesh. You can't make yourself a son of God by trying ever so hard and doing all kinds of rituals and doing this and doing that. It's not by the will of the flesh. You can't make yourself. Only God can do that for you. It's a gift of God. And then it says, nor of the will of man. And that's talking about the will of others. This is like talking about an organization, a church, a, a religious organization that can save you. No church can save you. No human organization can save you. They may promise that. Join us. Do everything we tell you to do. And you will be all right. No, it's not by the will of man. There's only one thing can save you. You must be born of God. You must come to God yourself. You must open your heart to Jesus Christ and receive him as your Lord and Savior. You'll be born of God through believing in his name. But that's the only way you can be born of God. It's a gift directly from God. Let's look at Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 6. Wonderful verses again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice, Jesus is defined primarily as the Son of God. And so, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Why? Because we're sons. As he goes on to explain, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. This is our inheritance as sons in the heavenly places in Christ. And there's the key. Christ is the son. That's what we were told in the, earlier in the verse. And when we are put in Christ, we're put in the son. Now we are recipient of the same love of God. The same blessings, the same inheritance is ours because we are sons of God in Christ. Hallelujah. I'm going to preach myself happy. Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us to be his children. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Our calling is to be holy. Because we're sons of God. We're members of a royal family. You know, I'm, they, the members of the royal family have to live by different standards. Yeah. And, and need special training. How do you live as royals? And likewise, for us, we are in training for reigning. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption. Hallelujah. Adoption as sons. By Jesus Christ to himself. According to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace. By which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Another classic passage is Galatians 4. Verse 4 to 7. When the fullness of the time had come. God sent forth his son. See this? God sent the prophets in the past, but now this is it. There, there is nothing higher. There is nothing greater. 
This is God doing the ultimate now. He sends his son to bring us into sonship. Born of a woman, born under the law to redeem, verse 5, those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. We might read over that, but we don't understand that that is the, that's it. That's the ultimate, to be made sons of God. There is nothing beyond that. And because, verse 6, you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. See, notice how it works. When we were born again, the spirit of his son comes into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, or already causing us to cry out, Abba, Father. In other words, it's through our union with Christ, the son of God, that we receive his spirit of sonship inside ourselves and we become, in reality, sons of God. And we cry out, Abba, Father. And the relationship of a son to the father, what does this Abba Father mean? And it was lovely in Israel sometimes to hear the children, the young children, cry out, Abba, Abba, Abba. And, and what is that? That is, first of all, love. Abba, I love you, Father. You're my Father. And it's implicit trust and confidence that the Father loves me. And will take care of all, all my needs. Abba, Father. And so the child looks to the father and says, Abba. It's adoration and it's also confidence in, in father's love. Hallelujah. And so it says that, we, that the, he sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, verse 7, you are no longer a slave. I would say only a slave because there's that side of the truth, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Literally, you are an heir of God through your union with Christ the Son. So sonship is the foundation for inheritance. As a slave, there's no basis for inheritance. But as a son, you have the basis for your inheritance in Christ. And then let's quickly go to Romans 8 also. Verse 14. Romans 8 verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And sometimes, you know, the Bible says we are sons because we are, have that potential. And sometimes sonship is used in the Bible in terms of the, the, when we reach our full potential. Um, and, 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 and then, for instance, when... Jesus was baptized, the voice that came from heaven, Matthew 3, 17. This is my beloved son. And the word in Greek is huios, which is a mature son. This is one who has grown up and now, now is like his father. And you, when you see the son, you see the father. And when the, the son speaks with the authority of the father, that's what we see with Jesus, of course. He speaks the word and the storm ceases. He speaks the word and sickness flees. He speaks the word and demons flee. He, he is walking as a man in the authority of God. He is God also, but he came to show us sonship on the human level. Hallelujah. And so that is huios, is the mature sonship, which we are aspiring towards and, and will come to pass. And uh, he says, as we, the more we are led by the Spirit of God, the more we are acting and living as sons of God. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. By whom, by the, whom the spirit within us brings us into the reality of sonship. And he inspires us to cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. The, verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so the Spirit within us, and, the, and the, the more we walk with Christ, the stronger that witness will be to us that tells us, I'm loved by my Father. I'm a child of God. And if children, then heirs. 
Heirs of God. So in other words, this is the basis for our inheritance. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Do you notice that? We are heirs of the Father. And we are joint heirs with Christ because Christ is the Son. The older, our older brother. But in Christ, we are also sons, and therefore we are joint heirs. We share in the same glory, the same love, the same inheritance as Jesus the Son. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together with him. In other words, there, there is a different degree of glory that we will have, which is determined by how much we love God in this life, and, and how much we are willing to suffer for him. Verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's our inheritance, comes in, in the form of glory. For the earnest expectation of, all, of the creation, and this is an interesting verse, isn't it? It's as if all creation is looking on. The angels and even the, the animal kingdom that is now in, under the curse. And the earth itself that's under the curse. All creation is looking for this awesome event, which is the revealing, the manifestation of the sons of God. Because the reason why everything's in a mess is because man has fallen. Uh, but when the sons of God come into their full manifestation, then everything comes into its order. Jesus gave us the taster of it. Here comes the true, son, the true son of God. And everything around him that is under the curse suddenly starts coming right. People get healed. People get restored. Joy is restored. The elements of nature come into order. And that was just a taster. And when Jesus returns in his glory and when we are, appear with him in glory, the whole earth will be restored. All creation waits for this amazing moment. But it, needs, it starts with the sons of God coming into their fullness. And then jumping to verse 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose. Now what is his purpose? We're told in the next verse, but we could say sonship. His purpose is that we come into the fullness of sonship. For, verse 29, whom he foreknew or chose from eternity past, he also predestined to be conformed. Now notice this, conformed to the image of his son. So God's purpose in our salvation is not just to forgive us and justify us. That's just the legal foundation. But his real purpose is that we become sons because we are to be in the image of his son. And so that's the, he's the blueprint. He's the image. And we are to become just like Jesus, the son. And so we, his purpose is sonship for us. That, we, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We are his brothers, his sisters. He's the firstborn. He's the highest, obviously. But we are family together. Hallelujah. That's his purpose. That to bring forth many brethren, his family. Verse 30 assures that God will fulfill this. Those he predestined, these he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And that's the, the last one is the sonship. The justification is the legal foundation, but the manifestation, he glorified. It's as good as done. Hallelujah. His glory is already working in you, by the way, through the Spirit. And you are going to be glorified. You're going to come into the manifestation of the sons of God. And let's just, just also, one more. John 17. This is Jesus' prayer for us. Which again shows what the ultimate purpose of salvation is. We're going to look from verse 20 to 24. I do not pray for these apostles alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. This is Jesus' prayer for you. That they may all be one. Now, I believe this is generally misinterpreted. Oh, he's praying for the unity of the church. Well, of course, 
that's a good thing. But I don't think Jesus is primarily talking about that right now. Because he goes on to explain that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me. So he's talking about the unity between the Father and the Son. And he's praying that we come into that same unity, that same relationship that he has with the Son, with the Father. That they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. It's the unity between the Father and the Son. He's come to bring us into that same relationship. Hallelujah. And that they also may be one in us. You see? That the world might believe you sent me. You come into your sonship. People will be, the world will begin to. That, and as you declare, and as you witness, people will come. The world will believe. Because they'll see something special in you. Because you're coming into your sonship. And notice verse 22. And the glory which you gave me as a son. I have given them. That they may be one just as we are one. Do you see? He's talking about us being one with the father. And the glory is the Holy Spirit being given us. And the love of God. He also talks about the glory being his love. He gives us that same love and that same glory. That we would be one with the Father. Verse 23. I in them and you in me. It's all vertical. It's not horizontal. That they may be perfect in one. That the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. In other words, this is a love relationship. And people, ideally, should be able to look at us and say, God must really love them. Just look at their peace, their joy, how they love. They, they, and they talk about knowing God. and They can see it in you. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. He wants us to be in that same relationship with God. That they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. The father-son relationship, above all, is a relationship of love. Of course, in our own families, we, we have different experiences of fatherhood. But it, deep in our hearts, we know what fatherhood ideally is. I can look at my father and I can see the many wonderful things he gave me. My life is much richer because of him. But yet, in other ways... His fatherhood was lacking. And, and, and no father, no human father is perfect. But somehow in our heart, we know what fatherhood is. God has put that, I believe, in our heart. And we long for fatherhood. And I, and I believe a son receives confidence from his father. There's something that a father, and only a father can impart to his son. In terms of confidence and calling him up higher. And I um, uh, forgot what I was saying now. But um, fatherhood is, father-son relationship, what does it speak of most of all is love. The father loves his son. In fact, the very first time the word love is used in the Bible, which is often a key biblical principle when something's mentioned for the first time, it's usually definitive in its meaning, is Abraham and Isaac. Um, God says, the son who you love. I'm asking you to offer him up. And the, the love relationship between Abraham and Isaac is a picture of the father-son love relationship. And so the word love is, is defined in terms of father-son. You might think it might be between a man and a woman, but the Bible primarily defines it as between father and son. And of course, we understand mother. Hopefully you don't feel left out here because God has, to, to create the picture, there are verses that talk about God being a mother because um, gender, I don't want to get too much into this, but both male and female, Genesis one twenty seven are made in the image of God. So the complete image of God is only revealed in both male and female. 
all right? But the Bible, choo and I choo we have to stay with the language of the Bible, which is primarily in terms of father. But I think in our thoughts, we can understand that mother is included within that. All right. So when you say Abba Father to God, what should be foremost in your heart is that he loves you. He loves you. He cares for you. In fact, Jesus' main teaching against worry in Matthew 6 is all based on the Father's love. He says, don't you think the Father loves you? Why are you worrying about that? Don't you know that your Father loves you? He has intimate care over your life. Don't worry because of the Father's love. And so, Abba Father, I love you. I know you love me. And I am confident in your love. And I know that you will give me all things. There's a precious verse. I don't know the, the reference, but he, he says, Fear not, little ones, for it is the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Father wants to give you all things. He has a wonderful inheritance for you. We need to re know the Father. Why am I talking about this? Because one thing is we need to cultivate our relationship with our Father God. Because then our heart will enter into rest when we know that we are loved by our Father. And if you had a difficult relationship with your Father, you've got to get beyond that and ask God to heal you and reveal himself to you as your Father. Jesus modeled what it's like to live as the Son of God, a member of the ultimate royal family. And everything that Jesus said and did and thought centered on his relationship with the Father. Forgive me for giving so many scriptures, but I just want to just read, really, without comment, just a, a little selection. If you read the Gospel of John, it is full of Father-Son relationship. I just want to give you a few quotes from Jesus where he talks about his relationship with God is in terms of Father and Son John 3, so I'm going to, this is a whistle stop tour through the Gospel of John here. But John 3.35, the Father loves the Son. Now I'm reading these because please apply them to yourself. It's not just about the Father and Jesus because sonship means we come into that same relationship. The Father loves the Son. That's, you can put yourself in there. And has given all things into his hand. Chapter 5, verse 17. My father has been working until now, and I've been working. The son is on the same team as the father. See, the father would always apprentice the son, and that the father and the son would work together. That's us. We represent him. Verse 19, 519. Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son does in like manner so he's always looking to the father and he wants to do the will of the father for the father loves the son and shows him the things that he himself does and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel for as the father raises the dead and gives life to them even so the son gives life to whom he will for the father judges no one but has committed all judgment to the son that all should honor the son just as they honor the father and so the father wants to honor the son. He, as you grow in your sonship, God can trust you with more and more things. And in the case of Jesus, he trusts him with all judgment. But in our case, we, we want to, if we are sons of God, the spirit in us, we want to please our father and we want to, our father to be proud of us. We want our father to be able to trust us. And we want to glorify our Father. This, should, this is the heart attitudes of a son that knows he's loved. Praise God. Um, verse 30. Um, I of myself can do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous. I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. That's the attitude of a mature son. Verse 43. I have come in my Father's name. Chapter 8, verse 49, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Verse 54, John eight fifty-four. If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me. 
of whom you say he is your God. Chapter 10, verse 30, I and my father are one. You can't separate us. Verse 38, believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. Chapter 12, 28, father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. God, the Father, will glorify you. And the more you honor him in your life, in your testimony, the more he will honor you. Chapter 12, 49. I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave a command what I should say and speak. He lives under the authority of his Father. Uh, verse 50, 1250, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. And of course, the famous verse 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's why you can only be saved through Jesus, because salvation in the New Testament is to become a son of God. And Jesus is the only son and so you can only come into sonship with God through the unique son who is Jesus. Through union with Christ is the only way to the Father. Hallelujah. Oh, so, so many good verses, but um, hallelujah. The sonship, what does it mean? Let me just wrap this up now. Sonship means authority. If we live as sons of God, we live under the authority of the Father. We live under the affection of the Father. He loves us. He cares for us. We live in fellowship with the Father. And that's why we confess our sins quickly, because we want to stay in that close fellowship with the Father. Sonship means honor. We honor the Father, and the Father honors, will honor us. It's the basis for our hope. It's the basis for our future glory. It's the basis for us walking in holiness. It's the basis for our forgiveness, as I explained. Let me say also, it's the basis for our confidence. I already wanted to hit this one before I finish. It's the basis for our confidence. I am a son of God. That's awesome. And that means not only that I'm chosen by God, I'm adopted by God, I have a wonderful inheritance in God, but I have the divine nature within me I'm not saying we're God don't get me wrong but we are sons of God and we can become like him and for instance this tremendous confidence that we see for instance in the Bible where it says I am more than a conqueror through Christ I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me I'm an able minister of the new covenant. And my, my particular favorite, Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are his workmanship. Literally, poema, which is where we get the word poem from, masterpiece, we are his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. So, when we were created in Christ Jesus that's talking about our sonship the new birth and we are not created to be failures we are created in God's image created in Christ Jesus for good works for excellence we are not created to be failures we are created to be successes hallelujah Conf this is what I'm talking about not confidence in my flesh all right, because we all understand crippling doubt within our flesh. When we walk in the flesh, some of us are better at disguising it than others. All right, about people admire confident people. Some people can put on confidence, and it's a funny thing actually. If you uh, if you just walk into a room all confident, you may not belong at that party at all. But as long as you can. Look like you belong. Nobody will, you know, and they kind of teach you that in, in the army a bit as well. It's kind of like, well, you may not know what you're, what you're doing in this situation, but just act as if you know what you're doing. And, and you'll carry most people with you <laughs> for a time. 
If you're faking it, it's not. Uh, what am I talking about? Um, <laughs> but I, I'm, you know, but we admire confidence because we all know what it is to doubt and the anxiety of doubt. And am I enough? Am I enough for this situation? Am I enough for this relationship? We may disguise it. But the awesome source of confidence, the real inner confidence that God will give us, it says, God has given us a spirit of power. Not a spirit of fear and anxiety. Oh, I'm not enough for this situation. No, as sons of God, God has put himself in you. He's given you a spirit of power. That means you can do it. You're enough. Not in your flesh, but in Christ you're enough. God gives you a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. You can be that good husband. You can be that excellent employee or whatever you are doing. God has created you for good works. Not for mediocre works. He's created you for excellence. Hallelujah. And that's the spirit. That's who you are as a son of God. You may not have tapped into the full potential of that yet. But you are a child of God. You are more than a conqueror through Christ. You are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Hallelujah. So we, we, it's not like we're meant to be good at everything. But God has created you for certain things in your life. And those things that he's called you to and created you for. He made you to be brilliant. He made you to be excellent. It's in you as a son of God. And that, that your sonship is your basis for confidence is what I'm saying. The real confidence, not the fake confidence. Because the spirit of the sonship is in you. He's created you for good works which God, the Father, has prepared beforehand for you to walk in. So whatever God has made you for, he's created you for to be excellent at that. And so in that sense, and only in that sense, you can believe in yourself. Not in your flesh, but you can believe in yourself because you're a son of God. And God makes his sons for glory. Amen? Praise God. All right. And so sons imitate their father. They seek to glorify their father. He says that we should love our enemies. And he says... In Matthew 5.48, that we should be perfect. Aim to be mature, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. If you are a son, and you know you're a son, you want to grow up and be just like Abba Father. And mature sons, we, we should all aim to become mature sons, to reveal in the earth to represent our father and to show the world what he is like the son should can say ultimately like jesus if you see me you've seen the father i don't think any of us would probably be brave enough to say that even in the lesser sense you know of well do you want to know what god's like look at my life but that that should be where we're where we're heading I'm not suggesting you, anyway, <laughs> praise God. And let me say this to close, that sonship also means that we are not isolated as believers. Coming into sonship means we are all brothers and sisters in the family of God. That is what the church is. That's why Pastor Hillary brought in a, a change, because we people would tend to say, hello church, in announcements and there's nothing wrong with that. But we think that the definitive description of who we are is family. Hello, family. Praise God. Because we are the family of God. So our sonship means that we are not isolated Christians. And those who, who live their Christian lives isolated from the body of Christ, from the community, from the family of God, they're missing out. Because sonship, you know, if, you, if somebody's born into a family and they have nothing to do, or they, they relate to the father, but they have nothing to do with the other children in the family, there's something seriously wrong there, isn't there? Yeah. And, and so sonship means loving the brethren, loving one another, recognizing one another 
equally as sons and daughters. That we are a royal family together and we do this thing together. And we love one another. And that's why Jesus talked about in the new covenant, there's a new commandment, which is love one another. I've been emphasizing the vertical, but it also means we live our Christian life. We live that life of a disciple as family. We need each other. We support each other. We encourage each other. That's what sonship means. We live out our life, our Christian life, as members of his body. Amen? Amen. Well, sons of God, arise. <laughs> Amen. Let us uh, pray, and then we'll worship God. Lord, I just thank you that you have made us sons of God by grace. We couldn't do it of ourselves. We couldn't make ourselves. No church could make us. Our parents can't make us sons of God. But Lord, when we came to you, Lord Jesus, and gave you our hearts and trusted in you, you gave us the right to become children of God. And we were born of God. Oh, we just thank you for this highest of honors, highest of privileges, that we are in your royal family for all eternity. Oh, that we are sons of God. And we can't even, right now we're children of God, as it were, but we don't even know what that ultimate sonship is going to mean. But we are coming into the fullness of our inheritance, the fullness of our glory as sons of God. You've predestined us to glory. Oh God, what a privilege it is. Oh God, thank you for loving us. Abba Father, we love you. We love you, Father. Thank you for loving us. Thank you. We want to become like you, Father. We want to grow. Help us to grow more and more like you. Lord, we thank you that you, you love us so much. You want to give us all things. You want to provide for all our needs. Thank you, Abba, for providing for us. Thank you for leading us in our life by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us assurance of our salvation. Assurance that we are sons of God. That we belong to God. That you love us. Just as you love Jesus, you love us, Father. Thank you so much for your love. And Lord, we're proud to be part of your family. We want to make you glorious in the earth. We want to shine. We want to show what you're like through the way we live, through the way we are. Oh, please make us more pleasing, more glorifying to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>